I've already introduced to you, and the show is his. Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, having me in here. Um, uh, so, Pat has set aside a, an, an hour to talk about the uh, relationship between instructional technologists and librarians. Um, I don't have an hour's worth of stuff to tell you um, about instructional technologists and librarians. Um, but I have a few thoughts, and um, then what I'd really like to, to, to uh, get going is some discussion about how you see this relationship happening on your campus. Because I don't think that at Rollins we have necessarily the answer, and I'm really interested to see um, what is a very dynamic situation from my perspective, and how that is working out on different, different campuses. But I also just want to um, congratulate the CIOs for getting together. Um, uh, you are ahead of the library directors at this point. Diane Graves at, at Trinity is um, looking to bring us and make us more active as a group. So you may see some stirrings from the library in terms of the SES on your, on your campus. And please encourage that. I think it, it could be really, really useful. Okay. Um, so, what I'm going to say at this point are my views. Um, we have a bunch of instructional technologists here in, in the room. Amy, Anna, Jessica, Harry. Um, uh, so, they may disagree. Certainly, I would expect <laughs> the librarians at Rollins to disagree with me. They usually do. Um, and, I, I, as I say, I don't have all the answers. So. Um, so Pat asked me to, to, to talk about librarians, the relationship between librarians and instructional technologists, and I'd just like to expand that in a little little bit, um, uh, because both of those are uh, somewhat um, nebulous position titles. They're defined differently at different institutions, and the models that we use to support the academic endeavor are, are different. Um, and so here at Rollins, I'd also like to talk a little bit about the IT Help Desk and the Tutoring and Writing Center. So, so these three academic support services, information technology, or certainly the academic portion of information technology, uh, the library and the Tutoring and Writing Center are all in this Olin building. Which is we visited yesterday. Hmm? We visited yesterday. Good. Good. So you have that picture in your mind. Um, uh, they're all designed to underpin the students and the faculty's work within in the curriculum and bring those three things together. It's our version of the learning commons model um, and it's a developing model. The most recent addition to that was the tutoring and writing center which came into that building, opened for services in that, in that building in January of uh, 2013. Um, this integrated model, which you know is not, certainly not unique, um, is uh, coming about at a time um, of when we're seeing this shifting paradigm about how people are engaging with information, not just academically, but, but socially. I mean, we were just talking about Google Hangouts. Um, this is happening in people's work lives, their social lives, as well as their, their academic lives. Um, and it's the, the paradigm is shifting from information that is based around the, the print object, from a librarian's perspective, print object to the digital object. Um, and our, that means that our interactions with information, retrieval, management, uh, consumption, creation, recreation, in general today that is mediated through technology. As, as Something of a historian, I would say it was always mediated through technology. Print is a technology. But now it's mediated through a series of computing technologies, which is different. At the same time that that sort of integration and that mediation is, is, is happening, um, we're recognizing that siloed administrative organizations aren't necessarily the most effective way of supporting our users. Um, so we, we, in the past, we've had these functions, these services isolated uh, administratively with the expectation that people will, will interact with them in some kind of serial manner. Uh, the student will um, come to the library, uh, do some research, and uh, interact with professionals as they, as they need to. Their research will come to an end. 
they will then proceed in an orderly fashion to a computer lab, where they will sit down at a piece of hardware, engage with some software, get some help if they need it, and they will, well, write their paper, create their presentation, whatever, whatever it is. Then they will leave that computer lab and they will proceed to the tutoring and writing center where they will, having recognized that they need assistance, engage with assistance in you know, editing their paper or something like that. Everything will come to a glorious end with this beautifully prepared paper. Print it. Print it. Oh, yes. <laughs> they will always seek help with printing. Always. Um, uh, we all recognize that that's not how we work, it's not how the faculty work, it's not the model of scholarship that we're trying to sort of engage these students in, it's never been how students work. Um, the research, uh, the, the sort of information production process is an iterative process. People are um, engaging with information, they're doing their research, their research is changing their ideas about what research they should be doing, they're re writing, they're engaging with the tools that they need to do that, while they're doing their research, they're engaging with services like tutoring or like the writing center. During that process at different stages, if their ideas are changing, they're going back and doing this one more time. Um, if we're talking about a faculty member, their, their idea that they want to somehow put technology into their teaching comes as one kind of usually very fuzzy idea um, and uh, uh, changes the nature of, the, of, of what they're trying to do in the classroom while they engage with that technology. That's what it's like, that's a good thing, um, uh, and that's how our services should be organized. So we're trying to move away from this siloed idea into this more sort of integrated and iterative idea. Uh, so that's all very well, it's all very abstract, right? Um, what does that mean at Rollins uh, today? Um, and what might it mean in the future? Um, so, let's just talk administratively. Pat reports to the VP for Business, I report to the Provost. Those are, you know, those go very, got very different silos in, in this institution. And uh, the Tutoring and Writing Centre actually now has just begun to report to, to me. Um, I, I'm not, I don't particularly care, I don't think that's particularly important. What's much more important is the relationship between the people in IT and the people in the library or, or whatever other services you bring together in this process. Um, uh, and a sort of shared vision about how you want to work with faculty, work with students, how you want to support that educational mission. If you've got the right people, you've got the right attitudes and you've got some idea of, of a shared sense of where you're going, um, you, you will achieve that. It doesn't matter. If, and if you don't have that, you can all report to the same VP. It's not going to make a blind bit of difference. Um, physically, as you've seen, if you've gone through the library, we currently have a, what I think of uh, as a real mishmash of service points and provision. Um, it seems at this point in history to work on some level for our users. Um, I'm not sure it's a particularly stable situation. We've got a classic circulation desk when you come in, great big old desk, right, facing, welcoming you when you come into that building. It's not only circulating books, it's not only doing reserves and those kinds of things. Um, it's also circulating equipment, iPads, laptops, cameras, international power adapters, bicycles, a dizzying array of wires and components. Um, all of those things are circulated by those staff because that's, they know how to do that. It's maintained and organized by the people in the IT help desk. So that relationship is, is very close in, in that river. Oh, everything's, they don't maintain the bicycles. <laughs> uh, yeah. Next week, maybe, we'll get um, just down the road, just that next to them, there's the uh, uh, classic IT help desk, and that, but that also includes uh, classroom tech support now. Um, we also have a reception desk for the Tutoring and Writing Centre, um, which welcomes users to that area. It answers some questions, but it spends most of its time helping people with a thoroughly obtuse scheduling process that we really need to get, get changed. Um, the other end of the building, we have a, a research help desk. Um, until recently, that was called the reference desk. 
um, in the most recent renovation that, that you saw that has slimmed down from a big old fortress reference desk um, uh, to a, a single desk where a librarian and, a, and, a, and a, a student or a faculty member can sit down and, and consult with each other. And it's sufficiently light that um, should we choose to uh, do away with that service point, it can easily be removed without leaving a big old hole in the, in the library. Um, uh, notice there is no service point for instructional technologists in that, that model. They haven't got a service point at all. They're out and about on campus, they're meeting in faculty offices, they're welcoming, welcoming many faculty and students into their own offices, they're on email, they're um, on the telephone all the time, they're all over the place. Anna's on her bicycle. So that's a physical arrangement, and as you'll all recognize, it is by no ways visionary at this point. It's not as though we have an answer to this issue. Um, but I do think it's very much a work in progress in, in what feels to me as a very sort of transformative and dynamic moment in, certainly from my perspective, in librarianship, and I, I think that that's true in, in information technology as well. Um, I'll talk about where, it, where, it's, where I think it's going to go in the future. Um, but apart from the physical arrangement, how, will, how are we actually working together? Um, which I think is probably more important. Um, I think uh, um, that as we get deeper into this digital environment, um, where our use of information is mediated through computing technology, uh, that I think the role of the instruction and reference librarian, you can call them what you will, but the people, the librarians who do that kind of role, direct user assistance work, um, and the instructional technologists, I think those two roles are converging together. Um, the best example of this at Rollins at the moment is, the, is IT's FITI grants, that's Faculty Instructional Technology Initiative grants. Each year IT awards a, a flexible number, it's, it's flexible, right? Do you have a top number that you award? I have a $25,000 budget. So, and each one is approximately uh, uh, $2,500, um, so you know, maybe 10 of these a year. Maybe more if they give you less. Um, the final award is actually made by the Faculty Standing Committee, the, the Professional Standards Committee, um, but uh, there's a lot of work that goes on beforehand um, before it gets to that, that committee. Um, the grants are designed to encourage faculty to incorporate information technology into their teaching. But they not only get a grant, uh, they also get a team, and that team consists of an instructional technologist, a librarian, and a director for the Center of Teacher, for Teaching Excellence. As one of the awardees said to me last year, when I was, I was part of her team, I've never had a team before, she said. Um, and that's, the, that's the, to me, the aha moment of these, these FIDI grants. Um, the team is more, more important than the money. Um, the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence keeps the focus on learning outcomes, pedagogical outcomes, those kinds of things. The instructional technology, uh, 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 the instructional technologist assists with the, the information technology component, the tools. They might be software, they might be helping building something like a wiki or something like that. Um, uh, they might be a, a, a an instructional role, uh, teaching students how to edit video, those kinds of things. The librarian is there to, to bring the content issues to this, to this group. Um, finding content, linking to it, describing it, uh, dealing with issues of copyright, intellectual property, access, those kinds of things. Um, faculty very often come into this process thinking that they're going to get some money to buy some hardware or some software. That's often how the grant applications are initially at least written. Um, but they come out of the process with a much more sophisticated understanding of the integration of teaching, tool and content. And I think that is the transformational piece. The other thing that comes at that is at the end of that FIDI grant, um, they then present two uh, forums on, on campus. Those are, we, Rollins is a peculiar institution, it's not that peculiar, but I mean, this, this is, I find it unusual that faculty don't show up 
to events at which faculty talk about their own research or their own teaching. You get very small audiences for um, a sort of interdisciplinary scholarship series, for instance. Um, uh, other institutions I've been engaged in, this isn't the case. Other faculty are very interested. It just doesn't seem to be the case here at all. Those presentations, uh, which are part of the sort of professor to professor series that IT does, are very well subscribed. Stud uh, faculty come to a lot of them and they're very interested in that. And I, I think it's a real uh, kudos to, to IT for doing that. And I'm really interested to understand how we could maybe get that to transfer to other areas. Apart from the FIDI grants, we're also seeing examples of instructional technologists and libra librarians providing coordinated in-course instruction with, with faculty, whether it, you know, uh, 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 Carrie and I in a, in a class talking about, you know, uh, the, the production of video, but also how to deal with, how to get audio and video that you can use without having to deal with issues of copyright into that, that video, etc. Um, uh, uh, LibGuides, is that, do people know what LibGuides are? So these are these, these, these sort of simple um, web-based uh, research guides. They would have been the old library pathfinders. It's basically a, a cut down sort of content management system for library resources. Uh, so we have LibGuides here. Many of, of your libraries do too. They're, they're usually created by librarians, but they're increasingly being used and they're being added to by instructional technologists, by peer tutors. Uh, the director of the Tutoring and Writing Center has each of her subject tutors meeting with the librarians who created those research guides um, very intentionally to talk about what resources are missing and those kinds of things. I met with one of the psychology tutors yesterday and she said to me, I wish I'd known about this two years ago. I wish you'd known about it two years ago as well, but hey, now she does. Um, I think I'd love to see the reverse happening. I'd love to see instructional technologists take that LibGuide platform and start building it for their own tools as well. So, so what's the role of a research librarian in an age of inf information abundance and with these highly sophisticated information retrieval systems? So we now got a, a generation of students that are being rewarded by these information corporations like Apple and Google, etc. They're being rewarded for knowing as little as possible about mm -hmm. the system. These systems are supposed to be, quote, intuitive, and you're supposed to walk away from them if they don't succeed, right? Um, so, you know, you will always do a successful Google search. They will even correct your spelling for you and present the corrected results to you. You never fail. Um, Apple is famously intuitive. Not for me, but for lots of people, it's somehow intuitive. And it's famously locked down, right? So you don't get a lot of over understanding how this thing works. Um, this is our generation of students. This is their expectation of how information, how they engage with information. And that generation of students is rapidly transferring into the next generation of faculty, right, who are already on our campus with this expectation of how this works. What does that mean for a, a, a librarian in that, in that context? Um, uh, you know, add to this, bring your own device, uh, choice of applications for any, any purpose, um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, what is the role of instructional technologists in that kind of environment? <coughs> well, for librarians, it seems clear that this is the, the information environment in which our users exist and work is not actually going to get any simpler. Um, at least for a, a serious researcher. Intellectual property, property concerns, vendors who don't play nicely with each other because they're trying to protect their market and raise their barriers to, the, to, to um, other vendor content. Um, a constant churning of formats, publishers, vendors, all of that will mean that, that, that um, users are confronted with a complex and fractured information environment in which to work. Um, Librarians are going to be less concerned with helping users search for information in an, in an age of abundance. They're far more concerned with helping people evaluate information, but also working behind the scenes 
in organizing information, describing information, trying to reduce those barriers to access. That means we need to be ready to hire, retain, constantly develop and educate far more technically sophisticated librarians than we have in the past. Uh, and librarians at the same time need to be far better able to engage with the faculty in the educational mission of the college. They need to be far more faculty-like than they have been in the past. And I think a similar dynamic is, going to be, is, is happening with instructional technologies. I suppose it's, far, it's possible that our faculty will become far more technologically sophisticated all at once, all in so the same way, <laughs> and that our information uh, tools will become so much easier to use, but I'm not going to hold my breath for that to happen. We're always going to deal with this 40-year range of faculty, this range of disciplines across, across the breadth, an incredible variety of sophistication and, and of expectation, and instructional technologies are going to be expected to engage in that. Um, as far as I can see, Pat is already hiring technologically sophisticated instructional technologists, and I'm sure you all are uh, as well. Um, she's moving to hire people who are far more engaged as partners with the faculty in the educational mission, which is like the librarians. Um, and I think she also, and the, and the instructional technologists here, also need to think about being far more sophisticated about content as well. Because there's a lack of distinction at this point between the content and the tool. The two are coming together. Um, faculty and students are using instructional technology to package, repackage, organize, distribute content. And they're doing that as digital scholarship. And they're doing it as open educational resources. Well, we hope they're open. I do at least. Um, many of these are not short-term projects. Uh, they're designed to be built over time, to last for a long time. And you need to build in at the beginning of that issues of preservation, issues of description, information organization, metadata, issues of copyright. Those need to be planned into the process from the very beginning. Those are the skills of librarianship skills of managing content, and the in, in, instructional technologist needs to take that on. Which is why I say those two roles are, are coming together. But that's enough for me. I, I, as I say, I don't think we have the right answer. <coughs> that's just something I've been thinking about for a couple of years. So what do you think? What do you think the answer is? Are they coming together? Are they moving further apart? What's happening on your campuses? As they've come together, right? I am the librarian who does instructional technology, mm -hmm. but it's not working perfectly. And everything you said uh, about uh, what instructional technologists need to know about what librarians do and what librarians need to know about what instructional technologists do, we are learning on the ground mm -hmm. and have had to create this position called, well, they at Red Tech created a position called information services librarian that does all of these things but you can't find someone who applies for this job that understands or is perfectly trained for the job and yeah. we've had people in the job that have failed at it and have moved on I mean they weren't fired but it ha it's hard yes it's hard yeah I think I think I, I don't know what, what's happening with the sort of uh, the preparation for instructional technologies but uh, the some people talk about a crisis in, 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 in librarianship, in the library schools. Uh, people aren't getting jobs out of library schools. Well, yeah, they're not getting jobs out of library schools because they're coming out uh, technologically um, utterly inadequate. Uh, then they, they, they're not, uh, they're, they're approaching, um, they're not approaching these institutions and these educational, the educational mission as in the way that faculty understand, in the way that they can engage with faculty. Yeah. So, yeah, we're not hiring those people. We have to, I think we have to in some ways create these people ourselves. Well, it's tricky because this position, there are now four. We started with two, now there are four. One position is vacant, and I think they're kind of stalling the application process because it's 
very difficult to find the right person. Mm -hmm. But it is written in the job description that they have an MLS, and it's arguable on campus whether that is required. Mm -hmm. I feel like out of these four positions, maybe two need an MLS and two need True. something else, and um, it needs to be uh, these people working together doing what I'm hearing people in this room do as instructional technologists and bringing the background we have as librarians. Yeah. Um, it's like a Rubik's Cube, you have to keep turning. Yeah, and that Rubik's Cube is going to be individual for, for each institution yeah. uh, as well. I mean, yeah. here we, the librarians have faculty status, the instructional technologists do not. Um, you know, yeah. build that into the process. Yeah. Um, uh, we just we just had a, a failed search in a, a librarian position. It wasn't one of these direct service to users position, mm -hmm. but the librarian sat down and said, you know, do we really need the MLS? Uh, does mm -hmm. it really need to be faculty? Do we need to really think about things in a different way? And they're very open to that. It's amazing that the librarians would say that. There's still yeah. a lot of, I mean, of course we want to make sure our degree is still valuable, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, after having done my this job that I've had for about a year and a half. I don't think you necessarily need an MLS. It has to do with a person being willing to be flexible, to uh, um, adaptability, uh, interacting with faculty, and building credibility with faculty, and whatever you bring that allows you to be credible with the faculty, that's what you have to use. Mm -hmm. I don't think faculty cares what degree you have. There has to be, you have to build this credibility so that we can help them with what they need and help them in a quality way. <coughs> Yeah, uh, bring value to the, what, what value are you bringing to that interaction? Right. That right. I know um, I used to work as a librarian at Washington University in St. Louis, and we did not have faculty status, but we also started moving more positions, you know, where it was easier to find subject specialists and train them to our model of librarianship than to find a librarian who is also, you know, expert in video preservation mm -hmm. or, you know, um, modern writers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so we are moving to that. So Jim Neal at, at Columbia calls these calls these feral librarians. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's thinking he's thinking of, of, of PhDs. Mm -hmm. You know, he's thinking of a biology PhD who mm -hmm. understands that subject and can bring sort of informatics yeah. into a, 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 a sort of health science like that kind of yeah. thing. But the same goes, I think, for technologists as well. We did. That's what we did at Oxford and where I was before. Mm -hmm. So we reorganized there, and the positions are actually with PhDs. Mm -hmm. And they are called research and instruction specialists. Mm -hmm. And the interesting piece there was that we needed someone who understood what a research question was. Mm -hmm. So it's how you help students if you don't know how to formulate a research question. Yeah. And generally, if instructional technologists had come through a master's program, they didn't necessarily have done that, and neither had librarians. That's right. So it became very much in finding these PhDs who knew the information sources for their field, right. and can speak the language of faculty, and have some idea of pedagogy. And so I think it's an interesting yeah. thing. It is this transformative moment, yes. I think. So Pam, were these additional positions and you no. still had reference librarians and instructional no. technologists? No, I re we redid the entire organization. And in fact, we've just done that at Southwestern. At, um, so we don't have a reference desk anymore or a research desk. Yeah. We don't have a desk, yeah. I mean, that kind of desk. But we have a group now that is instructional research and digital scholarship, and it includes our Instructional librarians, instructional technologists in that group, um, and Mellon Fellows, PhDs that will be coming in here working on the Joel Scholarship. I think one of the other things that you didn't mention that's an interesting intersection for librarians and instructional technologists is in special collections. So, and the use of primary source materials by faculty members with their students in classes, which is just such an excellent yeah. growing opportunity. Yeah. So it's very interesting if your special collections librarian ends up getting very involved in instruction and instructional technology, yeah. because that's where it's coming. That's a whole, a whole other exciting place. Right, right. You know, about 12 years ago or so, Susan Perry was really yeah. sort of the first one who, who brought these things together at Mount Holyoke. Yeah. Um, and then about 
two years after she retired, it sort of all disbanded, right? They all went back to being instructional technologists and reference librarians. I, I think that's true. I haven't talked to Mount Holyoke in a few years, but I think that's a true statement. Do you think Susan was just ahead of her time, and so the people weren't there, or, or is the training still not appropriate that we can't find these people? And Jonathan, you... Because I'm skeptical to your future vision, you know, that, that we're actually going to find these people. Because from a technology standpoint, the instructional technologists have more technologies to learn and they have to learn them in more depth and, and um, they're not experts in, in, they're not even close to experts in all of the technologies that they have to know. And then to add on top of that being reference, learning all of the things that a reference librarian has to know, it feels to me like we're asking too much out of an individual. And that they're, you know, even in my instructional technologists, I want them to have specialties mm -hmm. so that they do know a particular technology really well and they can work well with the right. faculty. So why can't we have a continuum of people who really know librarianship and the content and, and, and stuff like that, and then we have a continuum of folks who, who do work together. But why are we forcing them all to be the same person? I, you know, and I don't, I, don't I, I, said, I, I think continuum is a great way of saying it. I'm, I'm seeing this convergence, mm -hmm. I'm seeing, yes, a continuum. No, I'm not, I don't think, I don't think I'm suggesting that um, we should somehow lockstep have a, 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 some information technology slash research librarian position and we all need PhDs to do it, right? Um, uh, I think a continuum is m a much more likely outcome of this. Um, but from a librarian's perspective, what I'm trying to do is push them along that technology continuum. We have a similar sort of um, thing. Uh, librarians uh, have you know, particular expertise in particular areas, in, in business or in the sciences mm -hmm. or, or those kinds of things. And I'm sure many of your librarians have the same thing. Um, that's important, but particularly at small institutions like ours, we, we, you know, we have a limited number of people who are going to be able to pay attention to particular things. And um, the age when you could separate the content from the tool is gone. You have to know something about the, the two. But it's going to vary across the curriculum, right? The needs in the humanities are going to be different. Not necessarily less technologically sophisticated, but they're going to be different than the needs in the sciences or the needs in, in business. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our content, I mean, you know, uh, Dorothy, the, the, we don't call them subject librarians. They're not business, she's not the business librarian, but she supports the business programs here, um, is talking about the kind of content we need. It's not books and journals. It's data. Mm -hmm. And as soon as and, uh, it's and as soon as she begins talking about that, um, uh, we're talking about tools that, that can process, etc., and analyze that data. Right? Um, she's there's no way she can separate the data from the tool. And I mean the true same is true in, in special collections. We, we just hired our first digital archivist, and she was in the, the college paper the magazine. And she said, in a couple of years, that there won't be such a thing as a digital archivist. All archivists will be digital archivists. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think you're right. There's a continuum. I think it's just acknowledging that we are all doing the same. We are all starting to do the same thing, mm -hmm. whether a, someone comes to an instructional technologist or to a librarian. So it's blurred lines. And so we have to deal with the fact that historically we've been trained different ways but now we are doing the same work and so how will that transform over the next few years and, and as and as um, CIOs or as library directors what are we doing to uh, make that continuum smooth as possible encouraging people to, to provide the kind of support that we think is necessary and what barriers are we putting in their way Vicki, you have emerged organizations, so what's your take on this? Well, I'm just I'm thinking, huh. actually what I was just thinking is I think one of the things that may get in our way um, 
is that we're still using the same names, yeah. you know, the same titles yeah. for what is you know, really a very different function. Mm -hmm. And so we get like kind of lost in what is a librarian supposed to do and what is an instructor technology supposed to do. Um, and so it's a, it's a challenge. It's always a, a challenge. And, and in particular, I don't feel, I, I know for a fact that I don't have enough really savvy instructional technology people who are kind of on the, the edge and I have an oversupply of very traditional librarians who actually want to keep kind of doing what they've always done. And we, we talk about, oh, we're going to try these things and so we take a step forward and we slide back into kind of what we've always been doing. I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I think that, but I don't think it's okay to allow for that because right. Right. we like we get questions all the time that need your support, and we could just kind of try to answer them ourselves, or you know send them off, send a faculty off. Oh well, you have to go over there instead of actually going and grabbing that librarian and come into this conversation. Yes. Where like making them go two or three places before right. they can get mm. whatever project done and complete it. Right. So I don't think I think just because there's those tendencies, I don't think that's the right way to yeah. And you have to do it along the, the, the all along the process, right? You have to do it in you know, what kind of positions are you designing? What kind of people are you hiring? Mm. Um, what kind of expectations are you, are you setting? Um, uh, how are you giving them opportunities to develop and grow and those kinds of things? Um, it's a continuous process. That's kind of interesting, Carrie. So, okay. so how do you shepherd? So once you recognize you need to go to another subject matter expert, right? So at that point there, where I see the big drop off is that you send them off, you throw them over the wall, and nobody follows up on it, right? So you have this fugitive out in the wilderness trying to find a way to a solution. So part of our big emphasis this year is saying, look, you need to take ownership when you run across these things, and it's not sufficient just for you to send a chain of emails back and forth. You need to like take ownership of it and make sure that they get to a sufficient resolution. And that's where I see the challenges between like your work set up the same way. Mm -hmm. Our librarians have faculty status, and so the tendency is it's a live you know you send it to the library and you let them and you think well I don't have to follow up I sent it to the library or you know it's come our way the librarians don't follow up on it but in reality you really need to say hey I'm interested in you getting your answer yeah. which librarians typically are really good at they're they're really good at you know even if they don't find the answer you know people think they're helping them because they're high service high touch people but we don't have that typically and a lot of times when we have these you know departmental areas and I think I think that's the really that's the, we use the Cerberus ticketing system and the IT and library people are all on it and we have these p tickets where there are like six people on the ticket. We, I, I'll, I'm going to present later but um, I was going to talk about an example where a physics professor said I need more space on the file server. Just that's my question. You know, that's my problem to the help desk. Well we realized that over a couple of days he actually was trying to put movies on the file server we got him now where he can stream those movies, but if if we hadn't understood what he was doing, it was about the IT instructional technology, uh, which was library at our, our place, and so, you know, we had to ask him a lot of questions. He wasn't very willing to tell us because he thought he knew what his problem was, but um, I like that the librarians get added to the ticket. I like lurking on other tickets to see what's going on with um, the technology side of it and that we're open and not saying like, oh, you're going to have to go here for this, you're going to have to go here for that. But it's still challenging and I still have like, always have 10 tickets open, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, I, I, I noticed a couple of things about the way you phrased that. Um, send, as all, and over the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we all have those walls, right? Um, but uh, that, I think, is, is that, that's the piece to change there. I mean, that you have to get rid of that wall or knock a hole in it. And um, you have to walk with that person through that, that wall. Um, I think the other thing is, is and I think uh, Carrie is, is an interesting example, is, is recognizing what the sort of, what a librarian would call is, what, what is the information need, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if the physicist comes to you saying, I need more space, 
then you can you can provide more space, right? Or you can tell them no, one or the other. Um, but it's it's unpacking what that what is happening in that and, and having in your mind the instructional technology is having in your mind that there there may be something else going on here and that other people could be involved in this process. And the librarian doing the same thing, that the answer the answer is not just a pure like library answer, it could be an information technology answer. But if you don't have that um, and you haven't taken that time to build that relationship. Uh, and, and sort of opened people's eyes to the possibilities on both sides of that wall, then, you know, the answer is going to be obvious. The answer is just more space on the server. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one thing you mentioned, you know, in terms of those grants where, like, a faculty member saying, like, wow, this is the first time I've had a team. And, you know, thinking, like, faculty members, they, they do have this team in place kind of all the time. But getting getting those people to see each other as a team, mm -hmm. you know, that seems to be yeah. the big challenge, and not you know, not like this is the library's mission, this is IT's mission, but saying like this is our mission of supporting faculty and right. students. Mm -hmm. right. The team has to think of themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and I will admit that I don't think we do yet. I mean, I I, no, think, I think we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, I think yeah. it depends on who you get. Exactly. And it depends on all the people. So we have certain faculty that get this grant that resist having a team. Mm -hmm. Right? Why are you bothering me, telling me to meet with this group of people? Right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we also then have ones that love having a team, and then it encourages us as a team to work as a mm -hmm. team to form a faculty. So that all depends, but. Um, yeah, even with, like, you know, one instructional technologist may not work as well with one librarian mm -hmm. because same, just people are just... Oh, there's all the usual, yeah. you know, human things going on here. Mm -hmm. I know you're perfect, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, one of the drivers potentially against the team kind of thing is immediacy. Um, we, we, where are times where we have the instructional technologists in the librarians where they're not necessarily overlapping about something. Someone goes to their librarian and, and they get a uh, answer about blogging. Uh, and, and then the librarian, when they ask about it, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to work with instructional technologists. The librarian says, I, they were wanting the answer right then. And, and, and you know, I, I've had a lot of good relationships and all that, but there isn't as much of an interest at times to meet with that team because of time or it is, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure how much of this is true, how much of it is perceived. There's definitely more flexibility if it's related to one's scholarship than one's teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. they, the teaching they want the answer now because mm -hmm. they, they have a more compartmentalized sense of, of how they're going to approach something related to their teaching. Yeah, and but I mean, the, the grants... It might be a driver for generalism. Yeah. The grants are useful because they have a timeline an, an extended timeline, and you know, you're thinking about preparing a course for the fall, right? You've got a few months to do that, and then you've got this director of the Center for Teaching Excellence who comes in and sort of um, really refocuses on, on the learning outcomes and the pedagogy. Um, so um, th there's always that uh, idea of faculty, you know, just you know, give me the give me the software I wanted, or give me the space I needed, right? And let me get out of here. Um, uh, that that team and that formality somehow sort of provides a timeline that gives us the space to have that. If we're successful, it gives us the space to have that. Or about ten courses. Mm -hmm. time or yeah, but that's ten. Yeah. We got yeah. two hundred no, faculty. Very deep, very deep. It's, and it's deep, and and, sure. it, and they talk to each other, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, uh, they you you have this professor to professor presentation where you can get mm -hmm. you know twenty other people in in that room, and suddenly you're beginning to get real change happening mm -hmm. in terms of the use and of technology. You also, I would say to add to that, what also we see happening is now we, we as instructional technologists kind of know what librarian can do, right? And so we will, in another situation, suggest, well, you need to bring this librarian or kind of push mm -hmm. the issue. You need to have them come in and talk because it goes hand in hand with what we're doing. And so then you've got more people pushing that. Right? As we're talking, one of the things that's occurring to me might be thinking of the fact of having a shared mission. I mean, we talk about supporting people, but then we're often our sort of siloed ways of saying what that support is. 
if you were really trying to focus on that you're trying to improve student scholarship or you're really trying to improve that we're all sort of coming together to work on pedagogy, I'm thinking of a medical analogy. So if somebody comes in to see the doctor, which is about a cold, and you want the problem solved right then, it's an opening then to start a focus on wellness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that we're trying to improve and move forward, which means that if we were all focused on that, like the excellence in teaching, it becomes a lot easier to ask those questions and pass somebody off and we're thinking that way. But that's not necessarily, if you looked at a library mission and an IT mission, they'll have some of the same words, but they're thinking of defining the world and sort of problem solving, find the resources I need, help me solve my technical problem. Right. And not so much in saying, how are we moving this faculty member, these students, toward wellness or excellence in scholarship, I think, which might be able to bring us together a little more. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really true. I think the other thing that we both technologists and librarians don't really do is we don't see ourselves as partners with the faculty and kind of teaching and learning. We just kind of see ourselves as service points. Yeah, I think the partnership is really key. Part of it is about understanding them and being part of that faculty culture. Um, uh, but but uh, just explicitly thinking of this in terms of a partnership. So. Yeah, I, that was crucial here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I came, the instructional technologists thought of themselves as a service point. I mean, to the point where I had a woman who has now retired, and, and she was wonderful, but um, one day I went to her in her office and I said, hey, this faculty member is showing their photos in the library, just in this other room. I'm going to go to her opening. Why don't you come with me? And she looked at me and she said, but no, my job is to sit in my office and wait for, wait for someone to come in. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's not your job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was wonderful that she said that to me because... I didn't know that that's how she thought of her job, you know, and so we had to make a conscious effort to convince our instructional technologists of what their job really was, was to partner with faculty, right? Mm -hmm. And in the four years I've been here, other than Carrie, we have flipped over the entire instructional technology department right. just because of people choosing to leave or retirement, it's not, not anybody being fired. But we were able to bring in people who we hired them. This is what your job is. It is to partner with faculty. And, and that has totally flipped the department. This is increasing. I mean, we haven't had as much turnover in the library as, as Pat has had in, in that area of the library. Anyway. Um, but one of the key things I'm looking for in a new hire is, is you know, if you think about the two great sort of domains of, there are three great domains of the, of the institution, right? the students, the staff, the faculty. Um, so when I look at a candidate, am I looking at someone who approaches this from a staff perspective or approaches it from a faculty perspective? Where are they going to feel more comfortable? At the faculty party or at um, you know, a, a staff uh, birthday party um, in technical services? Where are they going to fit? Where would they be more welcome? <laughs> <laughs> where, do they, where do they feel at home? Right? Which is part of the welcoming process, but where do they feel at home? And if the answer is they feel at home with a, a set schedule of hours coming in the back door of the library, not the front door, um, do they do they think about their job as a staff? Well, a 37.5 hour job. Then I'm not very interested in that. So so we.